last section, we're going to talk about the average value of a function. Um, normally, the value of a function is specifically the y value or output, so maybe you want to keep that in mind as we go through this uh, section. We're going to, I don't know if you've noticed, but some of the free responses we've been doing, uh, there has been a question or two that has popped up that said, like, what is the average temperature um, using a table? What is the average velocity or average distance, I think, or average acceleration? And sometimes you have to use um, kind of like a trapezoid or Riemann sum to evaluate the integral. We didn't really discuss that too in depth as we were going through the free responses, but that's what this section is for, okay? So whenever we're finding the average value of a function, we're basically finding the average output or y value. So from previous sections, how would you describe we have found the average velocity if you think about particle motion? Average velocity, yeah? Average uh, change in position. Change in position, okay? It's the slope of position, aka change in position, uh, between two points. So you're basically finding the slope of a line between two points like in Algebra 1. So that would look like uh, P of B minus P of A over B minus A. Okay, change in position, slope of, or slope of position. What about average acceleration? Slope of velocity between two points. So that would be V of B minus V of A over B minus A. So up to this point, the only way you would be able to figure out average velocity is if you had the position equation. Similarly, the only way you could figure out average acceleration is if you had the velocity equation. But sometimes you might not have those functions available to you. Okay, that's what this integral is going to kind of help us investigate here. So what if we were to take a look at this integral? If you were to work backwards from acceleration, what would that represent? Velocity, right? And if we have a bottom bound of A and a top bound of B, that would be V of B minus V of A. But notice how this integral is a little bit different than the other ones we've been working with. This integral has one over B minus A in front of it. B minus A is, or is basically the difference or distance between your beginning point and ending point. So if we work backwards from acceleration, we get velocity. But since we're multiplying this integral by 1 over b minus a, we'd have to multiply this velocity value of 1 over b minus a, which is just b minus a in a denominator. What did we say this represented? The slope of velocity was what? Average acceleration. OK. Let's try the next one. If you work backwards from velocity, that would represent what? Position, okay, top bound of B, bottom bound of A. And since we're multiplying the integral by one over B minus A out front, we'd have to multiply that position by one over B minus A, which would just send the B minus A to the denominator. What did we say this represented? The slope of position was average velocity. Okay, so take a look at this. We can figure out average velocity by taking the slope of the position equation. But let's say you weren't given the position equation. What if you were simply given the velocity equation? You can figure out average velocity by integrating the velocity function and multiplying it by 1 over the difference of the bounds. Both of these statements represent average velocity. It just depends on which function you have. If you have position, you'll do slope. 
if you have velocity, you'll do integral, specifically with 1 over b minus a out front. So it all depends on what information you have. Okay, they both represent average velocity, but depending on what you have, you might have to use a different mathematical process, either a slope or an integral. Okay, so what this general statement tells us is we can find the average value of a function. Notice how this would be average velocity. This one was average acceleration. The average value of a function is simply 1 over b minus a times the integral of from a to b of whatever function you're trying to find the average of, the average output or y value. So we're still working with integrals. Now we're just trying to find an average of an integral, an average output. Some of these will be calculator problems like other integrals we've used, um, but other ones will be non-calculator. So we might have to do those kind of old school with calculus. So let's check out the first one. Find the average value, okay, y value or output of this function on the interval from one to three, and we're able to use our calculator. So what might this setup look like that we would need to use to type into our calculator? Using kind of what's in the box as a guide. We need one over the difference of the bounds. Two, right? If you go from one to three, that's a difference of two. Times the integral from one to three and then we simply need the function that we want to find the average for. So that would be x to the third square root of sine squared x dx. So we're going to go ahead and try to type that into our calculator. Okay, so on your calculator, let's go ahead and type in 1 half or 0.5. Then we need an integral, so we'll go to the math button down to option 9. Lower bound 1, upper bound 3. For the function, it was x to the third times the square root of sine squared x. Now, when you type in sine squared x, you're going to do sine x close the parenthesis, and then we're going to square that. Whenever we write sine squared, the two goes after the sine, but whenever you type it in the calculator, the two has to go after the x, a little different. And then we'll end it with a dx. Looks like we have 5.848. Okay, so the average y value from 1 to 3 is 5.848. You might have some y's less than that, some y values more than that, but this is an average. Okay, the average y value of that function. Let's try kind of the same question. Okay, find the average value of this function from 2 to 6, but we're going to try to do it without a calculator, so don't feel tempted to type it in, okay? Let's go ahead and do our setup. We need one over the difference of the bounds. If you go from two to six, that would be four. Integral from two to six, and we have two minus four x dx. Okay, now if we're gonna do this one by hand, we're gonna have to figure out an antiderivative. Try to figure out what we had previously. So let's maybe try to do this in baby steps here. If you have a 2, what did you have before? 2x. If you have a negative 4x, what did you have before? Minus 2x squared. Good. Uh, we know the bounds. That's from 2 to 6. So this is the antiderivative, okay, working backwards from the integral. But notice how we have to take that times one-fourth. 
Okay, we, have, we still have that 1 fourth out front of the integral, so it should be out front of our antiderivative. Okay, before we do top minus bottom, maybe we can distribute in the 1 fourth. So that would be 1 half x minus 1 half x squared. All right, fundamental theorem, top minus bottom, let's plug in six first. So a half of six is three, and then we gotta subtract six squared is 36, divided by two, we got 18, minus what we get when we plug in the bottom bound. So half of two would be one, and then minus, be two, half of uh, two squared. So let's see, three minus 18 minus one plus two when we distribute that minus sign. Negative 14, check out, okay. I know it says non-calculator, but let's go ahead and maybe check our work with a calculator just to make sure we were on the right or the right step or the right process here. We need a one-fourth out front. So you could do one divided by four in parentheses or 0.25 if you want to do decimal. Then we'll bring up the integral from two to six. And the function we wanted was two minus four x. We get negative 14, okay? So the average y value of this function is negative 14, meaning it's mostly below the x-axis. Some y values are more than this, less than this, but on average, you have a y value of negative 14, okay? Let's go ahead and see how this average value might pertain to a kind of a word problem or free response type question that we've been looking at. So very similar to some of the other ones we were using or we were trying to figure out. This uh, is a ski resort that uses a snow machine to control the level or amount of snow on the slopes. And over a 24 hour period, the volume of the snow added to the slope, okay, per hour, notice how that would be a rate, right? Snow per hour is given by this function. So maybe we'll label this as rate added. The rate at which the snow melts is given by this function. All right, so rate subtracted. Both of those equations have units of cubic yards per hour. And if we're looking at the first day, it makes sense that our times would go from zero to 24. At time zero, the slope holds 50 cubic yards. So this is your start amount. Are we getting good with like deciphering what a problem's telling us, like labeling what things mean? If you write big in arrows, it might be a little bit easier for you to reference the problem to find something a little bit more quickly. All right, let's try A. Compute the total volume of snow added, okay, just snow added, to the mountain over the first six hour period. How might you want to tackle that? There we go. Integral, so this was the rate at which it was being added. If we work backwards from a rate, that'll give us a change in amount. During the first six hour period would be zero to six. So 24 minus T sine squared of T over 14. Okay, so we have another sine squared in there. Just be careful when you type it in, the squared would actually go after the t over 14.
How does 142.413 sound? Is that good? Can you double check it? Let's see. Math integral 0 to 6. We have 24 minus x sine x divided by 14. Close the parenthesis and then you got to square it. 142.413. You also might need to check since we're working with trig that you're in radian mode. If you're not getting that, you might be in degree mode. So maybe check and change if you have to. What about units for that? If this is the amount of snow added during the first six hours. Yards, yards cubed, yep. They're talking about a volume. Okay, so cubic unit, looks good. All right, let's check out the other two. Find the value of the integral from zero to six of the m function, but also one sixth times the integral from zero to six of the m function. So kind of a little bit more calculator work. I think you guys can do these. We're gonna type in each one separately to get their value. The m function was the losing snow value or rate. Actually, once you find the first one, it's really easy to find the second one because you just divide it by six or multiply by one six, whatever you want to do. Did anyone get the first one? Just the regular integral from zero to six? Okay. And then if you divide that by 6, you should get the other one. 13.637. Say it again, 6. 3.7. Three, seven. Three, seven. OK. So now that we have the two values, we've got to talk about units of measure and what each one represents. OK. So notice how the first integral we calculated is actually very similar to the previous integral we did in part A. It's just that this one, we were using the snow uh, melting rate instead of the snow adding rate. So what do you think the units might be for this 81 value? Yards cubed. Yards cubed. And since this was the rate at which snow was melting, this must be how much snow actually melted between 0 to 6. So amount of snow that melted from time zero to time six, or during the first six hours, if you want to say that. What about the units on the 13 value? This is what's a little tricky. What do you think, Stevie? Is it yards cubed lost per hour? Yards cubed lost per hour. Good, this is a rate, perfect. So this whole idea of average value, notice how we have the one over six out front and the six is the distance between your bounds or the difference between the bounds. Whatever this function represents, that's what the answer represents. It's the average answer or output or y value from this function. So since this function was a rate at which snow melted, this is actually the average rate that snow melts. And since it's a rate, we need that fractional unit. So average 
rate at which snow melts during first six hours. Sometimes it might be mel melting faster than that, sometimes it might be melting slower than that, but this is an average rate at which it's melting. Okay, it's the whole idea of an average value. Whatever that function represents, that's what your answer represents. Okay, let's check out C. Is the volume of the snow increasing or decreasing at time four? If we're trying to figure out increasing or decreasing, what do we typically need to analyze? A derivative, aka slope, aka rate. Now they give us two rates at the top, so we're probably going to have to utilize both of those. Um, the rate at which snow is being added is the S function, but we also need to take in consideration the rate at which snow is melting, which is the M function. And we would subtract that because we're losing snow. So this is basically representing a derivative. You're bringing into consideration both rates, okay, both slopes or derivatives, and they're asking whether snow is, um, the volume of snow is increasing or decreasing at time four. So let's go ahead and plug in four into both of those functions, and we'll see what number we get out, and based on that number, we can probably answer the question. So again, it's a little bit more calculator work, but we're gonna plug in four into the S function, plug in 4 into the m function, and then subtract your two answers together. Anybody get it? Roughly? Eleven point eight. Is that good? Can we get that? Okay. So based off that number, is the volume of snow increasing or decreasing? Because? Increasing because uh, the derivative or you can say the, the rates, because we, we use two different rates, because the derivative is positive. If I can spell, derivative. Good. All right, let's try D. How much snow is on the slope after five hours? So we're kind of looking for a total volume here. Total volume. Can we think about what we need to figure out in order to get that total volume? Because we have this kind of complicated scenario. We ha we're starting with uh, some snow, but we're adding snow. At the same time, we're subtracting snow, or melt snow is melting. So what do we need to try to um, pinpoint here to get our total volume? Can we think about it in words? What do you think, Brayden? Amount started okay. plus the amount added minus the amount. There you go. We gotta take how much you start with, what they told which they told us was fifty, and then we have to add the amount of snow that was added. But in order to figure that out, since they give us the rate at which snow is being added, we'd have to integrate that to figure out the amount. And they want after the first five hours, so that would be from zero to five. And the S function 
was the rate at which snow is being added. But then we're losing snow as well, so we gotta figure out how much snow we're losing. Let's integrate the m function, the rate at which we're losing snow from zero to five. So again, a lot of calculator work. You can type them in separately, you can do it all at once but eventually you'll get your total volume. How much you start with plus how much you gain plus how much you lose. Bless you. Did we get it? Ninety-five? We on the right track? Ninety-five point three three five? Yeah? And if this is total volume, that would be yards cubed. We doing okay? All right, let's try the last one. Suppose the snow machine is turned off at time 10. So you're not really adding any more snow after that. You're just strictly losing snow. Write, but do not solve an equation that could be solved to find the time, okay, specifically K, whatever that point in time is, when the snow would all be melted. All right, so if we kind of visualize in our heads, we have a certain amount of snow at time 10, the moment they shut the snow machine off. But then snow starts to melt, and we want to try to figure out when all the snow would be melted, meaning we don't have any more snow left. So can we kind of think about can we figure out the amount of snow at time 10? What would we have to do to this to figure out how much snow would be or when the snow would be gone? You're starting with a certain amount of snow and then you're losing it, some of it, right? Because it's melting. How can we represent losing snow, the amount of snow lost? Did we do that up here somehow? This was the amount of snow we started with, plus how much we gained during the first five hours, minus how much we lost during the first five hours. If we want to represent how much we lost, we'd have to use an integral of that m function. But the question is, what are the bounds? What time are we starting with, and what time do we want to end with? Yeah, 10 to K, perfect. Okay, so we're, we have some specific amount of snow at time 10, and then at that moment, we shut the snow machine off, but snow continues to melt after that. So we're gonna start at that time 10 where we shut the machine off, but we don't really know what time the snow is gonna stop melting, meaning we don't have any snow left. So this is how much snow we have at time 10, minus how much snow is going to melt, and then what do we want all of that to be in the end? If all the snow is gone, it would equal what? Zero, right. 
okay? So we can say amount of snow at time 10. You could actually figure that out if you wanted to, couldn't we? Because this was how much snow we had after five hours. We could repeat the process to figure out amount of snow at 10, but it's not saying that we have to solve it. We just wouldn't need some type of setup. So amount of snow at time 10 minus how much snow is melting after that, and we eventually want all the snow to be gone, time zero. Okay, that one's a little trickier, but you got, you got to think about it in your head, kind of visualize the scenario and how you can represent those ideas mathematically. Okay, we have one more to take a look at, and we're done. Okay, one more kind of easier average value question. This was taken from a particular part of a free response question, so I think we should be able to do this. Notice the directions. Find the average value of f of x from 0 to 5. But what's a little tricky is notice how f of x is a piecewise function. You have two parts. So let's see if we can figure out this setup. In terms of an average value, we need 1 over the distance between the bounds and then we need an integral with those bounds. Let's see, we would have 1 over 5. And then if we kept going, the bounds would be 0 to 5. What function should we write in there? We have two functions. Can we write specifically one of them there? What do you think? Notice how the first function goes from 0 to 3 and the second function goes from 3 to 5. Do we have one single function that goes from 0 to 5? No. no, not quite. So what we're going to have to do is maybe break this up a little bit, okay, using a property of our integral. What if we went from 0 to 3? Could we write one specific function there? Yeah, wouldn't that be the square root function? Okay. But then what do we have to do, out, or what else do we have to do? Because we want to go all the way to 5. Right now we're just stopping at 3. Add the integral from 3 to 5. Do we have a single function that goes from 3 to 5? That was the other one, right? Okay. Now what's a little tricky is the 1 fifth out front has to stay in front of all of them. Because technically, these two integrals could be combined to get the overall area from 0 to 5. Notice how we're adding them together to get that overall area. So on your calculator, what I would do is figure out each one individually in terms of their number values, add them together, and you can multiply by that 1 fifth. Let's see, for the first integral, I got 4.667, if you're doing it individually. And then for the second integral, I think you get 2. So 1 fifth times 6.667. Looks like we'll get 1.333. Okay, so on average, the y value for this overall function is 1.333. Sometimes the y value might be more, sometimes the y value might be less. 
but on average, that is your average output, okay? So we can still find average values of piecewise functions of different equations, but we just gotta be careful that if the bounds go from one number to another number and one function doesn't specifically fit within those bounds, we're gonna have to use a property of integrals and break it up, okay? I hope that kind of makes sense because there's no way you can go from zero to five and just represent that with one function. You gotta somehow combine both like we did, okay? So average value, one over the difference between the bounds times the integral of the bounds of the function itself. All right, uh, free response day tomorrow, we'll look at some more average values and then quiz on Friday. I have a question. I have an answer. So on this one here, you were talking about if you were to repeat the process to find that answer. Mm -hmm. Now, would you put the amount after five hours plus the zero to five, or would you do five to ten? You do five to ten. Okay. Just to make sure. Yep. Okay.